Hello, and welcome to the Art of Intuition podcast. My name is Susan Jane, and I believe that trusting your intuition is the best way to live your life with meaning and purpose. Each week you will hear about how you can connect, develop, and trust your intuition through interviews with other guests and my own personal experiences. Join me to understand how your intuition can guide you towards a life full of meaning and loving purpose. Hello and welcome to the Art of Intuition podcast. My name is Susan Jane and I'm your host for this podcast. Now today it's actually been a little bit of a challenging week and I just wanted to share a few things with you. So over the weekend my partner's brother-in-law passed away. Now he was quite ill, he'd been quite ill for some time. Um, you wouldn't have known it. Like the, the, the times that I've met him, he, they live in Victoria in, um, in Australia and we live in Queensland in Australia. So we didn't see them that often. But when we did, you know, you, you just wouldn't have known that, that he was sick at all. You wouldn't have known. Um, but in the last oh, few weeks, he's really gone downhill. So he actually had lost part of his lung over the 10-year period, part of his lung, lost a kidney, got... Um, the cancer in his spine and it just kept it just kept on going it wasn't going to let him go obviously so unfortunately he passed away over the weekend now I didn't want to have this um, podcast as being morbid or sad or anything but intuitively we start to pick up different things when um, somebody is at the end of their life and when somebody does pass go through their physical passing into the spiritual side there's a lot of things that happen within us and how we grieve and how we deal with things. Now, the first thing it did for me when he passed was it gave me a very, very strong intuitive feeling of, well, first of all, we were working in the garden when it happened, which we we weren't aware of. We knew that he was, on, you know, going, but we didn't know when exactly. And we were both working in the garden, my partner and I, and I remember looking at him going, hmm, I think you need to check your phone. And anyway, he checked his phone, nothing on it. But we did find out later on that that was about the time that he was actually passing. Now, what it happens What happens to us when we pass, I'm going to go through it because I have had a near-death experience and I do understand um, a lot of things that have happened. So, um, And the other thing I wanted to discuss in this is the passing of my own sister. Now, she passed in a very similar manner in the fact that she had a brain tumour, so brain cancer, and um, what that meant to us. But with this latest one, if anything like this happens to you, we, we all are going to re react in, in a different way. We're going to respond in a different way to it. And that's what I want you to be mindful of because it's not always what you would expect. You you know, you might expect to be sad or you might expect to be um, even angry, you know, for different reasons. And there's lots of ways that we we will be affected. Now, this, any of these ways are our intuition connecting with us. Now, even if you feel that they perceive to be bad, they aren't necessarily bad, but they are allowing you to make some changes in your life. So when he passed, and, and I, I'm happy to dedicate this podcast to him, but when he passed, one of the things, or when I found out that he passed, one of the things that affected me straight away was I felt a lot of guilt. Now, it wasn't guilt for not being there because we couldn't be there. Uh, Victoria was in lockdown to start with, and then as Victoria came out of lockdown, Queensland went into lockdown, so we couldn't get down there anyway to be with them but I felt a lot of guilt for holding on to some of the stuff that I've been holding on to for the last couple of weeks and one of them was this um, tension that I had in in the household like with family members so um, this guilt came on quite strongly and, and we, we respond to guilt in different ways but this was this intuitive message to sort of go well this has happened this passing has happened how is it going to affect you? And this is how it, it did it to me. So the first thing I knew I needed to do was rectify this riff in the family, like in the local family. So um, there was quite a few tears um, and I needed to absorb it and understand it 
my best way. I knew I needed to do this and then I had to allow. So I asked, you know, okay, I need to do this. I, I, I acknowledged it. And then I allowed myself the understanding of how I wanted to approach this. What was the best way to go forward? Now, I don't do well in, in verbal confrontations. Um, that has it's, That's a known fact for me. I don't do well in verbal confrontations. It, it really upsets me. I really, you know, get a little bit crazy with that. So um, when we're looking at different things like this sort of situation, I needed to um, get a better understanding of how I wanted to approach it. So I did that. And then I approached it the way it suited me and the best way to get the best outcome. And that's what happened. And in, and there was, again, a lot of tears, um, a lot of understanding, a lot, a lot of chatting, and it was quite well resolved. So if and nothing else, the passing of this lovely man that, that went, which, which was so sad, really brought a positive aspect to the family in the fact that it allowed us to mend those bridges. And this is what we need to be aware of. When we're experiencing the emotions we're experiencing, when we're experiencing the different things, what does that mean? Yes, we are going to grieve when we lose a family member. That's a given. But what is it also trying to help us with, trying to take us forward, trying to... to, to um, rectify, trying to look at, trying to absorb. So the other thing that this, what, the other thing that um, did happen with this, and I'm talking about over a period of a few days, um, was that it actually brought me, took me back to when my sister passed. Now she's passed ooh, 11 years ago. Yeah, 11 years ago, I think it was. Um, she was my younger sister, next one down from me, and I'm from a family with eight kids. Um, and she was the very first to go. Actually, she's the only one to go at this stage. So, you know, it, it holds quite deep with us um, as far as the siblings go. So when she passed, and I, and I remember writing to uh, the family members when um, the gentleman was leaving last late last week, um, I remember thinking that one of the most positive aspects of her passing was the fact that we were all together. We all had the opportunity to be together in the room when she was leaving, right at the point when she was leaving. Now, again, um, I'd only arrived back from Queensland like the day before she passed, so I only just got there in time. But I remember when she was, you could you could feel the the spirit leaving you could feel it going and what we were doing is we were sort of not a tag team but we were taking it our turns you know like there was times when you needed to leave and and just get hold of who you are and what you were doing and and you know just have a break from it um because the grieving can be so so draining and then go back into the room where she was and spend some time with her so we were sort of in and out quite often for most of the day, that afternoon when I arrived there and then the next morning. So we were doing this in and out sort of thing and all coming in and, and having our say and, and talking to her and, and different things. And anyway, the nurse sort of said, yes, she's getting close. So you could feel it. You, you knew she was getting close. And I called the family in. Now, this is where intuition really did kick in because I had no idea what it was. I'd never experienced a passing in my life like this, so I had no idea what I was doing. Um, but I remember the family all coming in and we were a little bit gobsmacked. We just didn't quite know what to do. Um, and like I said, there was her seven brothers and sisters, her husband, her three ch four children, and mum and dad. So we were all jammed into this room and um, we didn't know what to do. None of us knew what to do. And I remember just thinking, we need to help her. We need to let her go. And so we all, oh gosh, I better get a teary with this, sorry. Um, so we all put our hand, I said, put one hand on her and the other on whoever's beside you. So we all connected up. And I said, I said to um, the family, and again, I don't know why, but I said to the family, hearing is the last thing. Don't let her hear you cry. 
let her hear what you have to say. And so I started and I sort of said, oh, I'm going to say my bit. And I said my bit. Won't repeat that. Oh, my God. Um, so challenging. So I said my bit. And then the others took their turn in saying their bit. And it was, you know, as hard as it is when somebody leaves, how lucky we felt that we could be with her and talk to her and, and you know, just spend that time with her. How lucky were we? Um, when you hear about people that have passed and uh, car accidents and things like that, you realise how... Um, how, how tough that must be because we were lucky we had the opportunity to excuse me sorry snipping um, we had the opportunity to say our goodbyes to her and as I said hearing is the last thing to go so she got to hear them um, well I want to believe she got to hear them and I can believe whatever I like <laughs> so it brought all that up for me again and it brought all these different things up so when we are passing when that's sort of that type of things happening um don't be surprised about the different uh, effects that it's going to have on you excuse me i'm just going to blow my nose um don't be surprised about the different th effects it's going to have on you but also don't brush them aside allow them to come through allow these emotions to come through they're not hurting anybody they're just making me look really ugly but <laughs> don't let them don't stop them allow them to come through because if you can imagine, every time you hold on to those emotions, you're holding them in your body. When you're holding on them onto them in your body, that's when they can start to turn to cancer, to problems, to polyps, to this, to that. When we're holding this stuff in our body, these emotions that we're holding in our body will turn yucky. And the more we hold them down and the harder it is to um, release them, and the more challenges we're going to have in our lives. So allow them to come through. And as you allow them to come through, um, just be mindful of what they're bringing up. So when um, the gentleman was passing, I got this feeling of, um, of guilt. Um, and so I went, well, why am I feeling guilty? And straight away I realised it's, it's because I've been holding on to some crap in this area in my life that I did not need to hold on to. It was so petty when you look at life in general and how really how short our physical time frame is. So that was that area. Now, how do I know some of this stuff? How do I come up with some of this stuff? Well, I've had a few experiences and I, and I have spoken to you about them on the podcast in many different ways, shape or form. So I'll just reiterate again <laughs> a little bit. I hope you don't get sick of my voice. But um, anyway, uh, three times I have left my body. I've experienced that, that disconnect between the physical and the spiritual. Um, but also in the same token, even though it's a disconnect, you're not completely disconnected. Now, the first time that happened to me was during a horrific, um, violent sex attack. Um, it was it was a pack rape, and I remember doing the same thing I say to you now. I remember asking, and it, while it was happening, and I remember, I remember saying, um, "Okay, I can't stop them doing this. How can I stop them doing it to anyone else?" And in an instant, I'd left my body. And I left my body and I was watching it all happen. Although I left my body, I could I was standing there watching it. Um, I saw everything. You, you saw it all, but there's no emotional attachment. It, your spirit doesn't have that emotional attachment. This is where I find things a little bit hard, a little bit challenging because when spirit, our intuition is talking to us, it'll often talk to or, or sending us messages, it will often do it with emotions it uses emotions to connect with you and yet it doesn't have that emotional aspect it just uses it because emotions are energy emotion so your spirit will use emotions to get you to respond in a certain way so when i was feeling this guilt i could have responded in in as many ways as i wanted to I hope I responded in the right way. I believe I did. But there's lots of different ways I could have responded to guilt. And in guilt, we can, we can respond with anger. We can, we can fight back because we're feeling bad. We feel guilty. We feel awful. We can fight back. Or 
we can suck it in and do the right things, which is what I felt I did. So leaving my body when this attack was happening, I just looked at it and there was just no emotional attachment to it, none whatsoever. You know, like I could see the, the blood coming out of the back of her head. And I, I say her because it's hard to imagine that that was me. I could see the blood coming out where the hair would be pulled right out through the roots. And you could see this, this energy that comes through, um, which was punched in the face. You can see this energy coming through and it, it's like vibrating energy coming through. And, and obviously that was pain. That was this pain coming through where she'd been punched in the face and the, the blood coming through the mouth and different. You could see it all, but you didn't feel it. You, you didn't have that uh, emotional attachment to it. And it was really weird. It's, it's, it's a, such a weird experience. And yet 12 months to the day when I had a near-death experience, I have to say there was emotions attached to it. Now, let me explain this a little bit more. Okay, so I was at work this day. It was, it was basically, it wasn't 12 months to the day, but it was within the week. I was at work. Don't know why. This, I worked in the bank um, and we were at the beginning of the day when we have, we always have a bank meeting before you actually open the doors. Make sure everything's all right, you know, check your, your security and all the rest before you open the bank doors. We were having this meeting and all, all of a sudden I started feeling really ill, feel really weak and, and feeling really ill. And um, one of the girls looked at me and said, are you okay? And I said, no, I don't feel well. And there was no reason for me not to feel well. I wasn't sick before. Um, there was, you know, no particular reason. All of a sudden I just had this overwhelm of illness, you know, like not, um, nausea and, and, and this really feeling of weakness and, and really sinking feeling. And the staff room was up this long flight of stairs. And she goes, all right, I'll take you up to the staff room. And I went, okay. I obviously started walking up the staff, up the steps. Now, when I say hearing is the last thing to go, is because that's all I remember, her saying, no, you'll have to help me, I can't hold her. That's all I remember her saying. Obviously, I was going down. And she was worried I was going to fall down the steps. I remember the first two steps, but I was halfway up apparently when I started to, to actually pass out. So obviously, and this bit I don't know because I forgot to ask, I didn't think about asking, um, they helped me up to the top of the, the stairs. Now, I remember, this, and I'll tell you what I remember because I found some of this stuff out later. What I do remember was I was laying down and everybody was looking over me, right? So you can imagine everyone was around and looking over me. So I could have been on the floor. I, I don't know. I was laying down and everyone was looking over me. And then I stood up, but everyone was still looking down. And I'm, I can remember thinking, I'm here. Why, why are you looking down? And I was heading up. Um, apparently there was a banana lounge at the, the bank, which I didn't even know. It was in the cupboard. And they'd opened that up and laid me on this banana lounge. Now, I found that out when I came to, but I didn't know then. Now, when this all happened, this is when I had my near-death experience. Now, I call it a near-death experience because I left my body. Uh, my spirit left my body and the, and what happened after that, which I'm going to tell you about, but what happened after that, I didn't know it was a near-death near experience until probably, uh, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 years later, I don't know, was when I started reading books. And when I read this book about near-death experiences, it was like a, a big aha moment. That's what happened to me. It's slightly different, but basically that's what happened to me. So anyway, what had actually happened is that I was, I was in this, everything was just all like, for want of another colour, white. Everything was like white. Now, I can't say it was like I was on a cloud because it, 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 you just you just didn't know. It was, I couldn't see very far, and I, but you could see. Um, I knew that I was walking down a path, but I could not see the path. I knew I was on the right track, didn't know what the track looked like. But then I looked at this sort of fog white side of stuff and it started to become thicker and thicker. Now, 
And when I say thicker, I don't mean thicker in density. It was almost like it was like a little sparkles that got bigger and bigger. And I can remember looking at this sort of sparkly effect of this, this these colours um, and then there was these darker ones that came through that were a bit bigger. They got bigger and bigger. Now, this happened when I was 19, 20, 19, around that age group. No such thing as mobile phones in those days. No such thing as anything like that. No internet, nothing like that. All right, so I don't know what was happening, but all I saw was like these, we did have TV screens and that's why I called them miniature TV screens, these little tiny TV screens. So these dark bits got bigger and bigger and they were little mini TV screens, just like your phone screen now, but tiny, really tiny. And I remember looking at them and going, what is that? And I thought, it's like little tiny TVs that are floating. This is really weird. And I looked in a little bit closer and it was my memory. It was a memory that I had, but I didn't, I knew they were memories, but I didn't like go in and see what the memories were. I just knew that they were memories. And it was like, oh, and they were just floating around. We weren't in bubbles. They were in like little TV screens and that like a little movie playing. And they were all my memories. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. Then I kept looking. Now, again, I knew I was on the path, but there wasn't a path, okay? Knew I was going the right way. Didn't know there was nothing around to tell me which way to go, but I knew I was going the right way. Then this dark sort of shadow arrived, you know, appeared, and it was like a big fence, like a big brick wall. But it wasn't a brick wall. It was just it was just a shadow. It was just a darker colour, um, like a brick wall. And I, that's why I knew I was going the right way because I was heading to the opening. And there's no gates. There was just an opening. But what I could see, feel, hear, I don't know, whatever it was, because we don't have those five physical senses, whatever it was, it was like little, it was like people's shadows. It was like people were there and they were peeking around the corner going, oh, she's coming, oh, she's coming. It was, it was really weird not thinking, oh. But the, the, the biggest thing, and I, as I said to you, there was, I suppose it's not a feeling. Because it was wasn't an emotion, but there was this unconditional love, this this strong feeling of coming home, of this is where I belong, and not even realizing that you weren't there before. But this strong coming home feeling, and and like I said, I I don't believe we have emotions in that sense, but this all encompassing um feeling of love was there it was so strong you know you, you felt like skipping it was like whoa I'm back you know don't know where I've been but I'm back and it was it was really it was really beautiful but there was this other little bit that was coming through this little underlying this deeper aspect so if you can imagine and this is how I put it down because this is not what it visually looked like but this is how it felt right like you were coming to a, a, an opening, obviously to a gate. Say you're coming to your own home. You're in your, you're coming up to the gate for your own home, and you know your home. It's like woohoo, and the kids are all there waiting for you. You're on the side there, and you got the dog, and there's the, you know, you, you, you loved tree, and everything's there, and you are whoa. And then you hear this voice in the house go, "You're not meant to be home yet." It's like your mum going, "I've been caught wagging school or something." It was this, like a voice of fear. You say a voice, but there was no sound. It was just that feeling, that energetic feeling like, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. And it was like, oh, shit, I've been caught out. <laughs> like, oops. <laughs> um, and as soon as I heard or as soon as I felt that energy, it was like, yeah, I've got to get back. And so back I went. And then, you know, I, I obviously came to apparently that they have got the doctor who was in there. There was a doctor surgery next door, got the doctor, um, and they gave me a shot of adrenaline to bring my heart back again and bring everything back. Um, but in those days, you know, like 
basically within the next half an hour, I'd lost my bladder. Everything was so embarrassing. Um, but basically, I, and they sort of said, oh, we'll call an ambulance and everything else. No, no, no. I, I, they let me get in my car and drive home after that because they didn't know. They, they weren't aware that as far as they was concerned, oh, she might have just, you know, passed out or something and, and she's good and off she went. I stayed away from work for the next week, so I was, I was quite out of it. But this, this all, you know, kept on coming through and coming through. But again, it wasn't until 15, 20, well, not 15, 20, it wasn't until like, I think it was about 12, 15 years later that I read this book about near-death experiences. And they talked about tunnels. There wasn't a tunnel for me. Um, I didn't, I didn't have that feeling of tunnel. But I must admit, when this, like this wall was there, it, it did feel like there was a light on the other side and I was heading towards that light but but my closest analogy to it is going like like you've been out and about for a hundred years and oh not hundred years <laughs> out and about and you're coming home and you know how good it feels when you come home especially when you're a kid and you sort of go you're coming home because you think oh mum's got ice cream in the you know there's a icy pole in the fridge or you know it's just oh, you can smell biscuits cooking or something you know so you're really looking forward to getting in there and then you hear this voice going nah you're not coming and it was like, oh, shit. <laughs> okay. So that was my near-death experience. So I'd left my body but stayed in that physical realm and watched it happening with this with this um, attack. The second time I had no idea and I, I actually obviously left um, the body but came back. The third time, and that was, like I said, after I had read the book and then there was another book called Astral Travelling. I read that book and I practiced doing astral traveling. So the third time I did it deliberately. Um, yeah, that was really exciting. But again, that took a few months. Like every night I'd go think, oh, I'm going to do this astral traveling. I'm going to leave my body. I rah, 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 did all the practice. And when I did do it, I remember I'm, I'm heading out the driveway and, and I know I was off the ground. I was heading out the driveway. It was so exciting. I just felt like Superman. But because I felt so excited, I had that emotion, straight away I went back. It was like, wow, look at me, whoop, <laughs> straight back in my bed. And I remember waking up thinking, oh, bugger, I was doing it and then I got too excited and then I came back. But apparently that's what it is. You, you must not have that emotional attachment to it. If you've got that emotional attachment to it, it's not going, it, it's, it's different. It's, that's the physical aspect of us, not the spiritual aspect of us. So the only... And I, you can't really call it emotion. Um, the only aspect that I can honestly say you have as a spirit is that unconditional love. And why I bring that all back again is because that was the most important thing about my sister passing, is when we were all there and we had our hands on her and we're all talking to her and we're all supporting each other, the unconditional love in that room was absolutely phenomenal. I have never, ever experienced it like I did with that room, apart from when I left my body and had a near-death experience. So when we're doing things like that, that's what's giving us an understanding of who we are and what we're doing and where we're going. So when you're if you're having anyone pass or anything's happening in that in that realm just be mindful that um you sorry there's somebody at the window um hang on a minute i'm going to pause this and i will be back in a minute hang on a sec just let me oh no if i end it i better say goodbye if you're in that spiritual realm just remember to to find out what those that um emotional aspects are and see if you have a reaction to it see what's happening we are in lockdown and um, it is a little bit challenging because i've got family home so i am going to say that's it from me um, if there's anything to do look join up on the facebook group i'm going to start live ones very very soon i've got that all organized now i'm hoping to start it this tuesday but join up on the facebook group i'm going to say bye for now they're hanging around outside trying to get in so i will <laughs> So I will be back soon. Um, I'm Susan Jane. Join me in the Facebook group. Hang on, let me get me the right spot. Where, are, where am I? Um, join me in the Facebook group. Uh, follow me on Twitter or any of those. 
Next week, I've got a guest, so that'll be really good. And I think she's talking about astrology, so that'll be really good. All right, I'm going to say bye for now, guys, and I wish you all the very, very best. Good luck with it all. Bye for now.